Hi again, everyone, and welcome to the third installment of our Countdown to Boston National Training Institute webinar series. Today, we have a presentation by Tammy Slavinsky called The Soul Crushing Job, Emotional Labor and Secondary Trauma in Prosecuting Sexual Assault Cases. We're going to go over a couple housekeeping details before we get started. We are going to record the webinar, um, so all attendees and folks that registered will get the recording afterwards. If you're having any technical issues, you should see a couple of folks with NCVC after their names. Um, one of them is Dashiell Coleman, also Eric Austin. If you, um, like I said, are having those issues, please send a private chat message to one of our folks who can help you troubleshoot the problem. We are not doing attendance certificates or CE credits for this webinar. And we also do have live captioning um, that is available at the bottom of your screen. If you click on show captions, there's a CC and a square above that. So you can click there to enable. And then feel free to chat <laughs> in the chat box. But if you have questions for Tammy, please make sure you are putting those in the Q&A box. It is right next to the chat box. That is the only place we will be taking questions from. I'll be monitoring those along with the rest of the NCVC staff throughout the presentation. And Tammy will be answering those along the way. Next slide, please. And just as a reminder, I'm sure hopefully many of you have already registered for NTI. We would love to have you join us in Boston this September. We are filling up very quickly, especially the hotel. So if you want to register and attend to join us, please do so as soon as possible. Um, registration fees will also go up in price on August 2nd. So your best bet is to register right this minute. <laughs> um, we also still have sponsorship and exhibiting opportunities available and you're free to contact us at National Training Institute at victimsofcrime.org for any questions. Next slide, please. And next month's webinar, it's our final webinar series um, before the conference, is on Preventing Revictimization, the Innovative Approach of Community Courts, presented by Lindsay Price Jackson from the Center for Justice Innovation. This webinar is on Wednesday, August 9th from 2 to 3 Eastern Standard Time, and you should receive emails to register for that in the coming days. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna introduce and turn it over to our uh, wonderful presenter today, Tammy Slavinsky with the Office for Victims of Crime Training and Technical Assistance Center, who's going to take it away, Tammy. Hello everyone, I'm seeing some folks post in the chat. You're from all over and that's really great. That's love to learn from people. So today I hope will be more of a discussion than simply me going through slides. So my name is Tammy Slavinsky. I use she, they pronouns. And I've been in the victim services field for over 25 years. My most recent work was on a college campus in Richmond, Virginia. I worked as a campus advocate, and then I did some Title IX work before I came to OBC T-Tech. So I would like to know who is in the room. We're going to do a poll. Um, let us know what your role is, hoping that we have some prosecutors with us today, because that's the focus of the presentation. But the information is really relevant for anyone who works in victim services. So please fill out the poll. Let us know if you're with the prosecutor's office, legal services and other type of legal services, nonprofit or private sector, victim services, law enforcement, another nonprofit, mental health practitioner, you may work in academia, be a scholar or a faculty member or other. And please let us know in the chat box. Uh, we have a forensic nurse examiner. Thank you for being here. Adult protective services a good friend who worked in APS for a long time. So thank you for the work that you do. We've got students, advocates from all over. Thank you for being here. Plaintiff's lawyer, thank you for being here. And military folks, thank you for your service. All right, so maybe we can go ahead and take a look at the poll results and see what we have. All right, lots of victim services folks, welcome. Um, you have my heart. Thank you for all the work that you do. And we do have folks from the prosecutor's offices and other legal services. So thank you everyone for joining uh, us in the discussion today. I work with OBC TTAC, the Office for Victims of Crime Training and Technical Assistance Center, and we provide free training and technical assistance to really anyone who works in victim services across the nation. And we do that through training, free training, 
um, through technical assistance. I heard someone refer to it as professional advice, which I love. So if you're developing protocols, you're working on developing an, a multidisciplinary team, really anything that you do to increase your capacity to work with victims of crime effectively, we are here to help. So today we're going to be talking about some com common terms related to vicarious trauma because there are a lot of experts in this space and I want to hear from you what you think. I'm going to talk about some original research that I did back in 2018 with prosecutors who work sex crimes. And then I'm going to talk about the, we call it the VT org, the Vicarious Trauma Informed Organizational Toolkit. It's a great resource for organizations that are seeking to become vicarious trauma informed. And then of course, Q&A. So here are some common terms on the screen. Again, I know that we have a lot of experts in this space. So if you wouldn't mind using the chat to tell everyone what you think of or how you would define burnout, compassion fatigue, and vicarious trauma. And of course, we're gonna talk more about the definitions for these terms, but I just wanted to lean into your expertise and please share what you think of when you think of any of these terms and feel free to post in the chat. We still have folks introducing, oh, disconnection, yes. Stepping away from the work because you feel disconnected, feeling exhausted, losing some empathy that you may have originally had, feeling irritable, for sure. Hoping you get the flu so you don't have to go to work. Oh, when you wish that you're sick because so, so you don't have to go to work, that's pretty, that's a, that's a sign of burnout, right? Moral injury that comes with doing this work. Well said, thank you feeling indifferent, having low energy, feeling complacent, in and out of your emotions. I like that you might be feeling it, but then you might feel some numbness, feeling frozen, avoiding, not wanting to go to work and feeling cynical. You all know what these terms mean. Um, and you may feel these times, you may feel this at different times in your work. And we're gonna talk more about the, the, the common terms and you know the, the definitions. So, for me, when I think about the terms, the key difference it with vicarious trauma is, you know, I saw someone posting moral injury, but really it's a change in how you view, view the world around you. And I know that for those of you who are first responders and victim services, you can probably relate to this. I certainly relate to it. Um, it's key. It's the key is to be aware that you are having these experiences because with burnout, you may say, oh, I feel so burned out. You go on a vacation, you come back, you feel hopefully refreshed. Um, there might be a little bit of, oh, I don't, I'm not ready to go back, which is normal, but it's something that comes and go. It, it can be addressed by maybe changing up your work, your workflow, your, your caseload um, by taking a, a short break or vacation. Compassion fatigue is really when, you're, when you feel like you can't fill your cup. And then again, the vicarious trauma is when you're you have a significant change in the way you were, view the world. And for those of you who were psychology students, sociology students, um, your schema, the way you view the world changes. But really there's been a growing awareness of vicarious trauma in the field of victim services, not only victim services, but with first responders as well. I, I teach at a university and I commonly have you know, social work students who are learning about this in school. So it's becoming more aware that this is just part of doing the work and it's okay. It's you know validating to know that you're not alone in feeling this way. And really, uh, this is a great quote from Remen, the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. So this quote really speaks to, this is just what comes with doing the work. And I've been in the field for a long time and I see a shift, you know, originally it's like, well, if you're going to, you're going to work till eight, you got to work weekends. There's the expectation that you just, for lack of a better term, you suck it up and you do it. Um, but I think that the culture is changing and that's why we do trainings like this to talk, <clears throat> to normalize and to validate that this is a part of that experience. So Molnar, Molnar and colleagues um, provided a framework for the impacts of vicarious trauma. And it's not all negative. We're gonna talk more about uh, resiliency and how post-traumatic growth can come with doing this work. And I hope that you will also, in addition to 
identifying with maybe some of the symptoms of vicarious trauma that we'll discuss, you'll also be able to relate to the good and the feeling. I say, I'm like touching my heart, you know, just me touching my heart, the good feeling that comes with doing this work um, because it is rewarding. There are rewards that come with it. So on the left-hand side, you see negative experiences that we'll be discussing today for everything from vicarious trauma to secondary trauma, traumatic stress, um, signs of PTSD. Um, the DSM-5 criteria actually um, mentions indirect trauma as a, as a criterion for um, PTSD. Um, having a neutral response, you know, this can come with doing the work with some time, with some experience, with some time. You get to a place where you can work with someone, you can talk with someone, and you don't have the immediate emotional response that you may have had in the past because you're building a skill set. You're becoming more resilient in your in your own in yourself as you do the work. And then, of course, the positive changes that we'll talk more about um, later on. So these are some of the symptoms. And again, I encourage you to post in the chat some of your experiences. You, you already mentioned you know, some of the definitions, but maybe if you feel comfortable um, sharing something that you've experienced or something you've seen in, in your peers, because this doesn't just impact us. And we're gonna talk more about this. We might serve a multidisciplinary teams. We may work with law enforcement, with prosecutors' offices. And if you come away with anything today, um, know that this happens to us all. And this might help us to have empathy and understanding for the people that are part of our, our part of our communities. So having to listen to survivors talk about things um, that you have lived through individually, you've had your own personal trauma and it can be, um, it can really bring forth feelings in yourself. I can definitely relate to that. I, you know, have learned through my career when I know I can notice in myself, my physical response, my emotional response, and I check in with myself and, okay, what is happening here? What is it about this case in particular that's really getting to me? And it might take a day, uh, it might take some time to think through it, but I can usually pinpoint what it is. Um, having some intimacy issues. Yes, that's a, that's a very common, uh, common symptom. Maybe having challenges with trusting people, challenges with commitment, because again, your worldview has changed. Thank you for sharing your personal experiences as a survivor. I'm also a survivor. So again, knowing when something is coming up for me and making those connections and no, but knowing that that's normal to have that response. Hypervigilance, yes, can definitely relate to that. So these symptoms are you know, very common. I'm um, having difficulty sleeping is one that I tend to experience, maybe thinking about a case and wondering what happened, wondering how they're doing. Um, and we're going to talk about strategies and techniques we can do for ourselves later on. Um, but we also, organizations have a responsibility to um, acknowledge the impacts of vicarious trauma. And we'll be talking more about that as well. So I'm going to talk through some research. Please don't go to sleep. Um, so please stay with me. I'm going to go through these kind of quickly, um, but you will have access to the slides afterwards. Uh, the main point of this research is to let you know that vicarious trauma is common across uh, professions. So in one study of victim advocates, you can see vicarious trauma and secondary trauma were found um, to co-occur among those um, who experience one form more likely than another. Burnout has also been shown to be a predictor of vicarious and secondary trauma. But importantly, and I bolded this, compassion satisfaction may serve as a protective factor. So acknowledging the importance and the value of the work that you do on a regular basis, taking the long view, um, having, you know, lifting up and looking down over the work that you do and having a vision for a better world. Um, this is, you know, what get, would get me through when I did victim services. I'm a huge science fiction fan. I don't know if anybody else is, but one of the reasons I love science fiction, not the dystopian, of course, but um, it gives me hope for um, a better future. So 50% of child protection staff also can experience higher, very, um, very high levels of compassion fatigue, law enforcement experience at least one type of critical incident, sexual assault nurse examiners. Um, I saw there's, you know, we have some folks in this space today that do that important work. They're also at risk for vicarious trauma. Forensic in interviewers, for example, who are being exposed to um, really traumatic images, you know, working with children, doing interviews, have talked about being unsupported by the system as a whole feeling like they have too many cases going from one case to, to another, 
um, and also having trauma spilling out into their personal lives. And several of you mentioned that, that that can impact relationships at home. So it's really important that family and loved ones know that this can impact um, you, us, me, as we do this work. There's also been um, signs of vicarious trauma in judges. And also the more you're exposed, the more that there can be a cumulative impact over time, which really makes sense if you think about it. So we're gonna shift into prosecutors because that's why we are here today to talk about um, that group of folks that does very important work with representing um, survivors in the criminal legal system. So criminal lawyers, this was an Australian study, um, have reported significantly higher levels of distress and vicarious trauma, depression, and cognitive shifts in the way they view the world. So again, going back to that change in schema, change in worldview, and you know, this impacts prosecutors as well. They can also learn to shield their emotions through their interactions with other court personnel. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the study I did in 2018, and it was a qualitative study, and it was a sample of about 15 folks. I'm gonna talk more about the sample shortly, but I met with, you know, again, did interviews with 15 people, and one of the prosecutors talked about the soul-crushing job of doing prosecution work. And another person mentioned this, I, you know, I finally have got it off my chest. I've been wanting to tell someone all about this. It's been so frustrating. So I heard commonly over, you know, across the interviews that there's an expectation to shield emotions like we saw in the other study and an expectation, you know, expectation to keep it together, keep going from case to case um, and not, you know, be not be open about their feelings with their peers, which can be a real challenge because as will be shown, peer support helps to mitigate vicarious trauma. So here's some of the sample interview questions. In your experience, have what have been the main challenges and obstacles that you faced in your role in prosecuting campus sexual assault cases? I was focused on campus cases in particular because I was work, when I was working in Title IX, I was interested in some of the tensions I was seeing between the campus process and the criminal legal process. And then looking at um, particular communities like the LGBTQ plus community and other underrepresented minority groups, what are some of the particular challenges in prosecuting those cases? And then also please talk about areas where you have the most discretion. So these were the questions that I asked during the, some of the questions that I asked during the interviews, but what really elevated to the top um, in terms of themes was secondary trauma, evidence of secondary trauma. And I have a um, peer review um, journal that is out and available um, if you would like to learn more about the study overall. But again, we had 15 participants um, with a 56% response rate. This was a study that I conducted in Virginia and I was identifying communities with a, a college or university where prosecutors were assigned to prosecute the sex crimes at those campuses. We had a mix of urban and rural. Um, most folks were female identified and um, as one participant mentioned, this was not, a mis uh, not an accident because she said that she had been in a field for decades. And she said that younger, um, less experienced and female identified prosecutors were more likely to, who were be assigned sex crime cases, which can make it really difficult, especially if a prosecutor is also a survivor. And some of the prosecutors I interviewed did mention that. And we also had um, a, a representation in terms of demographics and racial and ethnic diversity that was pretty comparable to what we see nationwide. So some of the themes in qualitative research, you identify themes and then you know, talk about some of the reasons why some of these things may be happening. Um, so one of the, some of these I'm elevating for you for this, for this webinar, because I think you know, they're really important is the, is a theme of bias and stereotypes in the system. And no one can say it better than the study participants. So I have some quotes here to describe some of the themes. Um, so basically a belief in the system that there's more folks out there that make false claims of sexual assault than those who actually experience sexual assault. I know that those of you who have been in the victim services field, um, whether it's a year or 20 plus years like me, you're probably still hearing this bias and this stereotype, which can make it really challenging for a prosecutor who has a jury of folks who may also hold those biases and stereotypes. And then also there was concerns around first responders holding on to these stereotypes that can impact the way they respond to sexual assault victims. 
And this one in particular um, mentions the extreme bias and um, harassment, I would say, that a survivor who was transgender experienced in the courtroom with a judge who, in this case, intentionally humiliated um, someone um, because they didn't you know, respect their pronouns, didn't respect their gender identity, and they were going to assign them to the male population um, upon conviction, even though um, this survivor was a trans woman. And again, from the standpoint of this prosecutor, um, I literally have goosebumps talking about this. This is why research can be so amazing. I can remember you know, watching their faces, they were telling me this story and how much it hurt them as a prosecutor to have um, their survivor that they were working with be treated that way. And they felt really powerless in, in that moment to make an impact and really frustrated with the system. So another one that really reflects the theme of secondary and vicarious trauma. What I tell new attorneys that come to me and say, I wanna be a prosecutor, um, she says to students, that's wonderful, but it's a soul crushing job. You may lose your ability to feel. And she talks about when she was chopping vegetables and watching the news when Sandy Hook happened. And she had a moment where it was just numbness. She just could not take on the emotional impact, you know, could not feel the emotion that would really probably happen with anyone that was watching um, the news when that happened. And she was, had been a prosecutor previously. She was out two years and she was still, she was just beginning to get her emotionals back, getting her emotions back. Andy, we and, do have one question. I'm sorry to interrupt. Sure, no, thank you. Um, so we have two, but one of them wants to wait for later. So the one for now is, what can we do as attorneys when judges are hateful and disrespectful towards survivors? That's a really great question because people have different relationships with their judges. And if there's any way that you can build a relationship so that you can have a conversation with them. I've been in the situations where um, insensitive things were said to a survivor. And, you know, as a, a victim advocate, my, you know, there are differences in power um, in any system. And there are situations where I felt like I could say something. And there were situations where I felt like I could not um, just being transparent. And in those moments, I would check in with the survivor and say, you know, what they said was not okay. And I work with a community multidisciplinary team. You know, I, I have relationships that I've built with folks so that we can have conversations so that something like that doesn't happen again. But that's where the relationships come, in, come into play because if you don't have a relationship, there is an element of formal, you know, formality in the courtroom. And in the moment, you may not be able to say something then, but maybe you can talk with them at another point. And also the generalization of law enforcement, I'm seeing some comments about that. You know, this study was done in 2018 and that was a comment from one prosecutor um, who had um, a couple decades of experience. And they, you know, since 2018, we ha do have a lot more um, training on trauma-informed response and victimology than we did at the time of the study. So thank you for sharing that. It's important to always acknowledge how we are growing and changing in the movement. So another theme is emotional labor, um, trying to be, this is one comment. So being realistic about the, what the process looks like to survivors and say that the only way we you know, make any change is by trying these cases, bringing them out of the darkness and out of the silence and trying to bring them to court. And we will do it together as a team and we'll walk down that path together. And they would explain to survivors that it's a marathon. So with emotional labor, um, it's really, the silent work of evoking and expressing feeling. There was some research that was originally done with people in customer service, but I felt like this theory really applied to the prosecutors because they were talking about the ways they needed to shield their own emotions and suppress their own emo emotions you know, in the courtroom, but then also how they tried to manage the feelings of the survivors. So they would do courtroom tours. They would have separate spaces for them to wait. Um, there was a prosecutor who um, at the time, the judge um, didn't allow animals, but that could have changed. Again, we're always changing. There are some courts now that have their own um, therapy animals, therapy dogs. But there was a survivor that wanted to bring a, um, I don't know if you all know what a sugar glider is, but they're a tiny, it looks like a squirrel, but they're very tiny. And she wanted to tuck it into her shirt. Um, so they they made it happen so that she could have that, um, um, I almost called it a squirrel, a sugar glider with her while she was testifying to help 
um, help her with, you know, the emotional impact of testifying. So emotional labor research with prosecutors, they've been found to express empathy and partially identify with survivors. I definitely saw this in my study and then also shielding emotions. Um, so this is other research that you know, speaks to um, some of the themes that I saw when I did my research. So if you all could just take a moment and think, you know, one of the, I had an aha moment when I did, when I did this study, hearing from prosecutors how challenging the work was for them have you ever worked with someone, another, you know, another person who works in the system and maybe saw some evidence of burnout or saw some evidence of vicarious trauma in them and something that could have been, you know, a, something you may have perceived as an, as an unemotional response or something that was insensitive could have been a sign of secondary trauma or vicarious trauma, um, especially someone who's been exposed to cumulative trauma over time and you know it's it's a challenge for them. Just take a moment if you'd like to reflect and share in the chat, you know, please do. But Katie, if we have any other questions now, I'm happy to take them too. Sure. I see you pop up. Yes. Um, so we have another question. In the military, we have to recertify our SHARP certificate every two years and must present our training hours. Does that same requirement exist for judges and attorneys that take on cases involving sexual assault victims? That's a good question. I don't know of anything that is specific to um, working with sexual assault survivors. I know that there are CEUs associated with any profession, but I'm not sure about, you know, for example, um, trauma-informed response, you know, that's, that's specific to that, but that's okay. a great question. And then the other question I think is appropriate for now as well. Um, what do you say to supervisors and more senior attorneys who fundamentally tell me that clients are like puppies, you can't adopt them all? when one, that's not what I'm trying to do, and two, I don't necessarily agree. That sounds a little bit like, you know, I'm not a clinician, but it sounds like a potential sign of vicarious trauma in that individual because they've learned to shield themselves from the work. You know, I teach a college course too, and they talk about, you know, they work in EMT, they work in law enforcement agencies, Homeland Security. Whenever you see someone who's been doing the work for a long time, and they just seem to be checking out, you know, encourage them to learn more about the impacts of secondary and vicarious trauma. And, you know, I, I tell my teenager, um, use I statements, nobody can take your feelings away from you. So being passionate in your work and letting them know that, you know, I'm not trying to adopt folks, but I care about the survivors that I work with and I'm gonna do everything I can to support them um, using a trauma-informed approach. So. Sometimes you're going to run into folks like that, I um, or you know, face individuals who may be burnt out, maybe feel that by maybe experiencing vicarious trauma themselves, and as a way to cope, they may be you know shutting shutting down their own emotions in response to doing the work. We do have one more question that I'm seeing in the chat. Um, okay, it's challenging to address concerns with our coworkers who exhibit these signs because they are often spread too thin already and can react in a defensive way. Any tips? That's a really great question. And we're gonna be talking about an organizational response to vicarious trauma towards the end. And really, if your culture is changed to become vicarious trauma informed from the top down, it will be easier for you to have those conversations with your peers. So it's really about changing the culture. And if you all would like assistance with that, with that you can reach out to OBC TTAC, but I'm gonna be talking about that more in a minute. So, excuse me, not a minute, right now. Um, so I gave myself an introduction to the next stage. Uh, so we've pretty much established, you know, through the research that vicarious trauma is an occupational challenge for the field. Um, anyone who's a first responder who works with victim services. And also a vicarious trauma or informed organization acknowledges this, that it's part of the work and also assumes responsibility for proactively addressing the impact of vicarious trauma through changing its policies, its procedures, its practices. So again, if you have that culture in place where from leadership on down, there's an expectation that, you know, we check in with each other. Um, I've worked in different organizations where we were able to build those relationships. And if someone was, um, for lack of a better term, coming at me, irritable, angry, not coming to work, all the things that you mentioned before, I would talk with them about it and say, you know, what's going on? Um, 
It seems like you're feeling, you know, frustrated. It seems like you're having a hard time um, connecting with the work. It seems like your empathy is at a lower place than it was before. And I know that you care about survivors. So being willing to have those conversations with folks is important because they may not realize it within themselves. And then of course, we're talking more about vicarious trauma than we ever have, but there's still a lot of people that don't recognize it and they don't know about the symptoms. Um, and that's where training and education can be really helpful. So if an organization doesn't address vicarious trauma proactively, these are some things that you've probably seen in your experience. Um, there's lost productivity. So some of you mentioned, you know, disconnecting from the work, feeling like you need to, you know, wishing you were sick so you didn't have to come back to work. Um, having more sick leave, having physical responses, you may actually become sick because <laughs> you're so stressed out and burnt out. Um, lack of cohesion in the group, um, communications and you know, challenges with communication and collaboration. And of course that can impact the quality of your services. Um, staff turnover, people leaving organizations where they don't feel supported. And of course, when you have to take the time and effort to rehire, I think I heard somewhere that it costs three times more to hire and train someone new than it does to retain the folks that you have. So just, and also poor organizational health at overall, um, diminished focus, people are losing track of the mission, the vision, the commitment to the work. So the Vicarious Trauma Toolkit that I mentioned um, earlier, this is, this is something that was developed in 2017. It is evidence-based, research-based um, on what was available in the literature at the time. And we're always you know, looking to update the toolkit. It's focused on first responders, um, not prosecutors yet, but we have other um, victim services, um, EMS, fire, and law enforcement represented. And the toolkit is, has, is based on, again, the research that shows that there are key pillars that if you have these pieces in place, you will have a vicarious trauma-informed organization. So leadership is very important. From, like I said before, from the top down, there's an acknowledgement that this work impacts us. It's okay for us to talk about it with each other. It's okay for you to talk about it with me if I'm a supervisor. Um, we do weekly check-ins to have conversations about the impact of the work and what I can do as a supervisor to support you. That also goes to management and supervision, employee empowerment and work environment, training and professional development, giving people opportunities to grow where they want to grow, um, not just the director of the organization, but everyone in the organization, and then also focusing on staff health and wellness. See you again, Katie. Got another Hi. Hi. <laughs> I don't know. I just keep That's helpful. Up. Just put on the yes. camera and I know that you need me. <laughs> so this question is directly related to what you were just talking about. Um, and then okay. I have a couple others as well. So how to bridge the gap between the staff that offers direct services and upper management whose views may have shifted already to promote a trauma-informed practice? Okay. So the leadership does have buy-in to shifting the approach. I didn't quite get the question. I am not sure based on the question. I was reading okay. it as they may have not bought in yet. Ah, okay. Well, you could reach out to us for training uh, on the Vicarious Trauma Toolkit and just a Vicarious Trauma 101 and how this impacts organizations. Um, the training is free. Uh, we do, you know, during especially the pandemic, our requests for training on Vicarious Trauma went up 50%. We're now at about 70% of the trainings that we do are on Vicarious Trauma. And um, hopefully that will help because again, people just may not acknowledge, they may not recognize that this does, there is a culture change that needs to happen if we're to sustain in this work. And I have, you know, working in a national technical assistance um, organization, what you're sharing is a common theme that we're seeing. So there are generational gaps between, you know, people who have been in the field for 20 plus years and folks who are emerging professionals. So I mentioned before that, you know, I teach at a university. I also teach a trauma-informed response um, for first responders course. And um, there are you know, people who are going into law enforcement, um, becoming prosecutors, defense attorneys, the other students in my class. Um, I teach them about vicarious trauma. And I really want emerging professionals, you know, sorry, directors, if I upset you, but I really want emerging professionals to say, hey, I have a family. I, I you know, I need to leave at five o'clock today so I can spend time with my family so that I can take care of myself so I can sustain in this work. Um, so again, it's a culture shift. 
you all can help us with that, but we are happy to help you. So please reach out to us for free training and technical assistance. We have question? another question okay. about tips for interacting with state's attorneys, specifically talking about victims waiting to hear if charges will be filed and they won't even return calls from organizations advocates. If you have any ideas around how to interact with them. Well, I building the relationships is important. And I know that sometimes that's a one-way street and you have to work really hard to build those relationships and build trust so that people cuz you know, there's research that talks about the, the conflicts and roles between um, victim services, uh, law enforcement, you know, prosecutors, you know, the end game can be a little bit different. The end goal can be a little bit different, but that we are professionals who work together. Um, we are trying, we all can agree that we're trying to better society, right? So let's start there. And I would go, I would invite people out for a drink. I would invite people out for dinner. Uh, my favorite thing to do was invite them to training. And when you would go to a training in person, especially, you'd go somewhere together, you would connect, um, maybe learn a little bit more about them. And I, I was, you know, not successful with everyone. Um, but I also, you know, when I worked very closely with, um, with law enforcement too, and whenever I also try to acknowledge when the good things happened. So I would send letters because I knew that in their promotion file, it was important to have acknowledgements when it came up for promotion time. So I would send a letter to the chief of police and say, I just want to acknowledge the work that this officer did with this, um, with this survivor. It was very trauma informed. So remembering to acknowledge the good that people are doing, like some of you were mentioning in the chat, um, not generalizing that it's all negative. That's a very important point. All right, I have one more for you, Tammy, sure. and I'm going to let you keep That's going okay. and we'll come back to some no, of the no. other ones. Let me look at my um, calendar. How do my we protect here. ourselves? How do we protect ourselves from vicarious trauma when the survivor you're serving experienced something you have personally experienced? Mm. When I share that I am a survivor, they apologize to me for having to share their story, but I want them to know that I'm here to help. Mm. So, and this is just for me. Um, I usually did not, I'm a survivor, but I usually did not share that with other survivors because then I found that they wanted to take care of me. And in that space, in that moment, I wanted them to know that I was there for them. Um, I, there were situations where I felt like it was needed, um, because someone felt like I, you know, didn't understand what it would be like. But I didn't go into details about my experience because, again, I wanted to center on what they needed. Um, so, you know, so I'm not saying don't ever share, but I'm saying that, you know, I I would choose and pick when that was um, when it seemed like it was a, a good moment to share that so that it was always centered on their experience, because I did find that they wanted to take care of me. Um, and I, you know, I learned early on that it was probably best to only save that for certain situations. So the vicarious trauma um, VT org is what we call it for short. It's uh, we haven't there's an assessment that's part of the toolkit and it doesn't measure your own secondary trauma or vicarious trauma. I'm going to share a tool with you at the end that you can do that the ProQual sur survey. But the Vi VT org um, assesses the organizations basically the employee's perception of their performance over the past six months on certain key items. So, you know, for example, um, I have adequate vacation, you know, never to always, it's like a Likert response scale. And we always encourage people to give this assessment to all the staff because I remember working in an office where the um, office assistant who answered the phone, you know, answer, answered the door, came to me one time and said, I, I did not know that how hard this work could be. Can we, can we talk? And we ended up doing some role plays um, because they wanted some basic language that they could share with survivors to help them because they were starting to feel impacted by the work. So it's really important to include everyone, maybe someone even that does your books because they are likely to hear stories in the hallway or hear other folks share experiences that might be, you know, cause them to feel some indirect trauma. And then when you do the assessment, it helps you to identify areas for strengths and for improvement. So this is just one example, 
leaders model a healthy work-life balance. So I don't know for those of you who've had um, supervisors who never take a vacation or never take a real vacation, they're still emailing, they're still calling, they're still checking in. Um, so if leaders model that work-life balance, you're gonna be more likely to see that across the organization. People won't feel guilty taking a vacation. And I've worked in organizations where I've had both. So um, I work working with a team that says, when are you gonna take a break? Oh, so valuable. So the blue pit, blue, excuse me, blueprint for vicarious trauma informed organization. Um, this, this arrow basically demonstrates that this is not something we come in and do a training and then you have a vicarious trauma informed organization. It takes time. It's a culture shift. Um, you learn, you assess, um, you look for areas for growth, for, um, for opportunity. You also identify the strengths that you have. Maybe you have um, a really great wellness plan. Maybe um, employees have access to EAP or counselors. I think I saw somebody in the chat earlier mention that you have you know, clinical supervision or access to um, therapists, hopefully you're trauma-informed so that your teams can be talking with them about the experience, experiences that they're hearing when they're working with survivors um, because that can really um, take the load off. Again, I've had the experience where I had that support. I've worked in organizations where I didn't have that support and it really made a difference. So leadership buy-in is, is critical. I mentioned that before. Um, it's the culture change won't happen unless you have the top-down support. And also it's important to recognize champions in your agency. There might be folks in the space today who are really passionate about this and wanna see your team thrive and sustain in the field. Um, and really lean into those folks because they can keep um, they can keep the momentum going and keep the passion going for um, mitigating the impacts of vicarious trauma. Also provide support for collecting, collating, and reporting. If you do that assessment, you know we could talk more about that. If you wanted to um, access the technical assistance through OVC TTAC, and it's also important to acknowledge that we don't live in a vacuum. We don't work in a vacuum. There are you know, intersections of historical trauma, community trauma, and individual trauma, like someone mentioned in chat, being a survivor themselves, um, being exposed to community violence, having intergenerational trauma, for example, if they had domestic violence in their family. And then of course, you know, looking at racial trauma and the impacts of, you know, there's emerging research on the impacts, for example, of not only experiencing um, abuses, but also witnessing on television. television if you um, are part of a, a racial minority and you witness it, what impact does that have on communities and individuals? So really important to keep those pieces in mind too. And then also supervisors need tools and guidance and that tool, the tool toolkit that I presented to you today, you know, please visit it. It's a lot of information that can be helpful. And then also, is this the right time for your organization? Not every organization is ready for that culture shift. So it's really important to, to assess if you're ready and that's where we, we come in to help. So I've talked a lot about the impacts of vicarious trauma, secondary trauma, a toolkit that you can use for your organization, but it's really important to acknowledge the positive. So if we pay attention to what's happening with ourselves, what's happening with the work, we can become more resilient. We can have compassion satisfaction where we feel that sense of satisfaction that we are making an impact. Um, I know that you all probably didn't go into this work because you make a lot of money. You came into this field because you care about survivors and hopefully what you're doing helps you to sustain that satisfaction. And then also vicarious resilience and vicarious transformation, which I'm gonna talk about on the next slide. So vicarious resilience is basically where you become more resilient through the work that you do. You have a greater perspective. Remember I mentioned before, like kind of lifting up and that I do this to myself on a regular basis. If I'm feeling something, I'm having the feelings, lifting up and trying to figure out, you know, remember the end game, remember the end goal and um, taking the long view. Why am I doing this work? Why am I, this is very hard. It's um, victim services, first responding work is very difficult. What brought me into this field and what sustains me? Um, it can, you can have, be optimistic. I mentioned I love science fiction. The reason I do is because I have optimism for the future um, that we will maybe one day not have gender-based violence. Um, for example, that's the area where I work, um, community-based violence. 
if we get to a point where we're able to address some of the greater societal issues that we face on a regular basis, maybe we can get there. Increased sense of hope and understanding and the possibility of recovery. Um, you may see this in the people that you work with. You see them overcoming significant challenges and barriers and still coming through on the other side um, and you know, doing, doing what they want to do and you know, getting the outcomes, get, obtaining the goal, achieving the goals that they want to achieve, whatever justice looks like for them, um, getting a sense of satisfaction from that. And then having a renewed commitment to the work and finding meaning. Why am I still doing this? This is hard, but I'm still doing this and I'm doing this for a reason. So vicarious transformation, I have a quote here on the slide. Um, it's really integrating that larger understanding of humanity as a result of facing the truths of our, humanity, of our humanity. We're facing these traumatic events. We are hearing these stories. We're exposed to horrific images. And it can result in a positive transformation. We have this empathic in, engagement with the people that we work with. We see their courage. They, uh, we witness the struggles that they go through. And again, they get to the other side. And we also acknowledge the changes within ourselves. So it's really easy and what, what, what we talked about before with the person who you can't adopt everyone. Um, it sounds like maybe they're not engaging with the impacts of the work within themselves and they're choosing to set those, um, set up that wall instead of you know, taking on um, or acknowledging the way that this work impacts them. So given what you know about a resiliency is there anything that you can do? And you're welcome to post it in the chat. You know, think on it, reach out to us for support, um, for ideas. I'm gonna share information at the end. How can you enhance resiliency within your teams? Um, so I, someone mentioned before that, you know, they, if they have a colleague and are seeing that evidence of burnout and vicarious trauma, what can you do to help support them in mitigating the impacts? And Katie, do we have another question? We do. Um, I'll okay. ask these two while folks are typing. So how can okay. staff share their inherent on-the-job compassion injuries with upper management without feeling like their statements will be documented or looked down upon? That's, that's a really great question because the reality is in some professions, that acknowledgement can result in retribution. Um, I'm thinking about healthcare responders, for example. I don't know if you all recall, there was a, a physician, a new, um, she had a newer physician who um, died by suicide during the um, pandemic um, because she was afraid to acknowledge the impacts of the work. And that resulted in federal level change and training and education in the healthcare field because I did not know this until um, we talked about it in my class that there were professional repercussions. If you were seen to have a mental health, a behavioral health condition, that that could be, could result in you losing your licensure. So there needs to really be change in an org, at the organizational level and the public policy level that this work, again, it's the, the culture is shifting, but it's not, we're not at the other side of it yet. So we're still trying to educate organizations and systems so that they acknowledge A, that this happens, and B, that we have an organizational responsibility to address it. And as a supervisor, I want you to be able to come to me and say, I need a break, or this is really getting to me, or I'm a survivor. And when this person told me their story, I've had physical responses, I had emotional responses, I'm having trouble sleeping, and know that your supervisor will not write you up or you know, think that you're weak. Because in, in my opinion, you know, this is just Tammy talking, that shows strength when you can admit that something is getting to you because it gets to everybody. And how do we encourage law enforcement, state's attorneys, judges, et cetera, to get training when frankly, we have no business doing so? Hmm. I'm gonna go back to the relationship building. Uh, if you're able to have conversations with um, one prosecutor, one police officer, um, just build a relationship with someone who knows someone there's usually a champion in any organization. I knew of an officer um, who, you know, they wanted to start a peer support program. That's something else that is really coming into fruition over the last decade or so. Again, acknowledging that this work is hard. 
um, who was having challenges with getting their leadership buy-in for peer support. But I checked in with them recently and now they have it. There's just more conversation. Um, International Association of Chiefs of Police have a vicarious trauma program. Um, and I, there are, are also resources out there for trauma-informed courts. Um, I, I know it can be difficult when you feel like it's not your place or not your business, but trying to make connections with people who can make that happen. And um, again, if you bring in free training and technical assistance to your area, inviting those folks to, to join. Um, and we can you know, help you with that and try to identify ways to build those connections. And then what we usually do when we do training is we find someone from law enforcement, from a prosecutor's office, a judge, to deliver the training. And then um, I know Katie, you mentioned at, at the start of the hour that we aren't offering CEUs for this training, but I usually recommend to people that they try to get CEUs so they can draw people in for the training. And the training doesn't change everything overnight, but it can start a discussion. Okay. So addressing vicarious trauma, we have, you know, keep the questions coming, we're here. Um, together th three o'clock Eastern time, but I want to talk a little bit about addressing it. Again, acknowledging that this is part of the work. It's okay to ask for help. You're not alone. And I hope it's okay for you to ask for help. Um, and if it's not okay, um, you know, please reach out to us for, um, for training and technical assistance. Hopefully, if we come into your community, it doesn't necessarily have to be your agency, but if there are other agencies and we all, you know, we have a training on this topic, hopefully it'll generate some discussions. So for yourself, um, you know, regular vacations, work and computer free. I have a colleague who uh, told me that they, when they're on vacation, they just know when they come back, it's just going to be too much. There's going to be, and they happen to be a prosecutor. So they they knew that their inbox would be full, their voicemail would be full. So they designate one hour during their vacation per day where they're able to just take care of some things so they don't come back and feel overwhelmed. And that also helps them to um, appreciate and be engaged in their current vacation because they're not worried about that inbox that they're going to come back to. Staycation, if you don't want to go away, um, find a local um, tourist attraction that you haven't visited in your area. Um, exercise, the research is clear. Any type of movement, movement that you can do helps. Um, healthy eating, having a regular sleep schedule. There's so many sleep apps out there now that can be helpful. I have people that swear by, I know people that swear by them. Scheduling breaks throughout the day um, to check your email, to try to have some time where you um, can reflect on your day. And again, take that long view and just you know regroup. And please feel free to share in the chat what works for you because everybody is different. Taking a real lunch. Um, I'm guilty, I've been guilty of this eating at my desk. One of my favorite things to do is to just go outside. I remember one time when I was working on campus, I disappeared for uh, 45 minutes and I left my phone on my desk and they called um, campus police <laughs> because I was gone from my desk and I didn't have my phone with me. And I was like, you know what? I was taking a break. I didn't want to be contacted. Uh, so it's, it's important to take breaks. Setting clear work boundaries, um, letting people know when you've reached your limit and you need to take a break having activities and hobbies outside of work and connecting with people that you love. Mindfulness practice, the research shows if you're able to be in the moment, um, it really makes an impact. Let me see if I have my, oh, I do. I have my little frog here. So this is a frog statue that I found in the woods when I was walking my dog um, a few weeks ago. And I was, mind, I was trying to be mindful be in the moment and I was looking at my surroundings and I looked down and I saw this this frog buried in the in the mud and if I had not been mindful and um, had been on my phone or had been thinking about the million things that I need to do I probably wouldn't have found that frog so it's a good reminder to me meditation yoga practice my sister loves yoga I love to run I love to move I love to exercise that's what works for me do what works for you and of course laughter um, being able to laugh is important. Supporting a colleague, be alert for signs and symptoms in them. And if you are comfortable, um, you know, maybe even talk about how you took this training and you've started to reflect on how the work is impacting them, um, just to model that behavior for them that 
I'm starting to feel burnt out. I'm starting to feel like I'm disconnecting from the work. I'm having a, tr I'm having more trouble with empathy than I used to. Have you ever felt that way? Are you feeling that way now? Um, think about how you want to be supported and let people know. So let your supervisor know how you like to be supported because again, everyone is different. These are some of the tools that I mentioned before. Um, the ProQual survey is what you can take individually to assess your level of um, secondary trauma or compassion uh, fatigue. And it's really important if you acknowledge it within yourself, it's a first step once you identify, trying to determine ways that you can address it. And again, you can have your own strategies that I mentioned in the last couple of slides, but it's really important for organizations to um, have a vicarious trauma-informed approach with their staff. And then also I wanted to mention low impact debriefing. I have been guilty of doing this in the past when I worked with a team. Having you know, heard a really challenging story or narrative from a survivor and then going and talking to my colleague about it. Um, I wish I would have known then what I knew now, I'm always learning, but I'm basically exposing them to the indirect trauma of the person that I just worked with. And then they also have their own caseload. So keep in mind this low impact debriefing, I'm sorry it's small on the screen, but the TEND Academy has a lot of great resources like this. So letting someone know that, hey, I just heard a really um, challenging story from someone. Is it okay if I talk with you? So asking for consent before you share, for example, and then thinking about what do I need to share with them in order for me to get through um, to help mitigate my own stress. Do they need to know all the details or can I just share a couple of um, feelings that I'm having as a result of what I just heard? Here is my contact information, um, obctech.gov. I saw that someone asked um, for a copy of the toolkit and things like that. Katie, I'd be happy to share links to the toolkit and um, with you if you are able to share those after the event today. But our website has a wealth of information and if you would like to reach out to us for um, free training and technical assistance, please do so. All right, and you've got a couple more questions. Okay. Um, what kinds of team practices would you recommend to teams to build team resilience? What kind of practice do you suggest supervisors of interns or junior staff that are not spending as much time in the work, but definitely are exposed quickly and deeply in the issue? Well, with, well, one thing I would think, um, well, one thing that comes to mind is that I would try not to assume that people are not impacted if they're exposed to it less. Because we've been hearing you know, in the field that people who do the billing can be exposed to um, traumatic stories or hear things or see things. Um, so just start from the place that this impacts all of us and um, be and creating that space, especially during one-on-ones where one of the things I've, one example that I heard earlier or recently that I love is asking someone, what do you want out of these supervision sessions? Where do, where do you like to begin? Let's set the agenda together. So, because some people aren't comfortable sharing their emotional response to the work, some people are. So it's really important to customize it based on, on what um, your staff need. And again, that assessment can be really beneficial because things will rise to the surface, areas where you as a supervisor can hone in um, to try to improve upon. Um, so for example, the work-life balance, are you demonstrating a work-life balance so that the rest of your rest of your folks feel like they can? Great, and your last question is, how can you help a coworker that you've seen presenting with burnout and vicarious trauma, but you don't know how to approach that person because he or she does not wanna share it or that they're private? Right, I, well, hopefully, you know, the example that I shared before where you're modeling, sharing your experience, um, but again, not everyone is comfortable sharing that. And I don't know if you're a supervisor or if you're a team member, but talking with your supervisor about it also. And you don't necessarily have to call out that person, but you can say, you know, I think that we would really benefit from having some conversation around the impacts of this work, just so that we can acknowledge that it's happening. Because again, people may not know that it's happening within them. And it, once they know, they know. Um, I wish that we had been, you know, I wish I was exposed to this information 20 plus years ago when I started in the field, because I think it would have been really helpful. And I still remember the moment when I learned about vicarious trauma, because I was like, ah, yes, yes, <laughs> that's right. That's what I feel. And just to know that it's, it's normal um, is very validating. Absolutely. Well, Tammy, thank you so much for spending your afternoon 
with us. Um, we're so grateful to you for sharing your knowledge and what a wonderful presentation. Um, her, Tammy's email, like she mentioned, is up on the screen. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to her. As noted, we will be sending out the slide deck, um, some links that Tammy's going to provide in the recording of the training via email uh, in the next few days. But if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us as well. And we hope to see you in September in Boston and next month at our final webinar. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.